You're working on your game and you run into an issue. Your code is turning into complete spaghetti. You have 20 different weapon types, but each time you want to create a new one, you have to code it entirely from scratch. It's a huge pain, but not that bad since you can copy it from another weapon and tweak it a bit. But you realize that you actually need to change how the weapon attacks work. It's the same code, but you have to go into every single weapon file and change it. What if you have 50 weapons, 100 even? That's not sustainable. Also, each weapon has some sort of different functionality. So when you loop through your inventory, you're having to do these massive, ugly conditional blocks to handle different weapon behavior. It's all essentially the same code. There has to be a better way. Well, I can assure you there are many better ways, but one common solution is to use something called object-oriented programming. In this video, I'll go over four core concepts that make up object-oriented programming and the benefits they bring, along with going through an example using the Playdate SDK to show how to practically code it. Let's get right into it. What you're probably familiar with is the concepts of variables and functions. However, you often find yourself in game development where you have many of the same type of things, like a group of enemies. In this context, it makes sense to group related variables and functions together into some sort of object, as well as to allow each object to have its own relative information be self-contained. To do so, you would create something called a class, let's call it enemy, that contains variables called properties such as health or position. You can also define functions called methods that are shared, like damage or move. You can then take this class and create many instances of it, which we refer to as objects. Each object lives on its own and holds its own data. This entire concept is called encapsulation. This way, you don't need to duplicate a bunch of code to have multiple of the same thing. You can just create multiple instances of the same class template. Imagine for a moment that you're driving an automatic car. What is offered to you? Mainly, you have the wheel, the gear shift, the gas pedal, and the brake. You shift the car into drive and press on the gas and go. However, in reality, what's going on behind the scenes is a complex process where gasoline and air is being sucked into the engine, gets compressed, and is ignited to push pistons to turn your wheels. But you don't need to know anything about that whole process, just the interface into it. Imagine having to manually execute those steps every time you went for a drive. It would be too much of a cognitive load. What if you end up switching to a car with a different type of engine or an electric vehicle? Does it make sense to have to relearn a completely different way of driving? The simplified interface abstracts away any complexity to allow you to focus on the important task. The same concept can be applied with code. Let's say you originally have some tile-based game and your player implements a move to method. However, in a moment of inspiration, you decide you want to switch to an isometric view. This requires a different way to calculate your position. But through the power of abstraction, you can just swap out the implementation and any code that uses the move to method is none the wiser and would probably work fine. This feature of reducing the impact of change is very useful as you find you have to refactor your game code a lot. And this could save a lot of headache of having to go back and rewrite a lot of dependent code. It also makes it simpler to understand your game's architecture. You don't have to remember any specifics about how something is implemented, just the exposed method. This concept is called abstraction. As a side note, if we're trying to be completely accurate, Abstraction necessitates the existence of private and public fields, but the built-in class system for the SDK does not provide that behavior. Again, let's say you have a tile-based game. In the game, you have the player, who can play as many different archetypes, like a knight or a rogue. The game also has enemies, of which there are also many types, like a skeleton or a ghost. While these are all different game entities, in reality, they should have a lot of shared behavior and properties. For example, each entity will have a position on the tile map, health, and some sort of movement function. Then, at another level, all of the player archetypes should have some sort of shared behavior as well, like taking player input or some sort of special ability. It would make sense, therefore, that we would have some sort of entity base class, and we can have a player and enemy subclass copy or inherit that shared behavior and extend it, while furthermore, we can have different player archetypes inherit from the player class, and the different enemy types inherit from the enemy class. If this example sounds familiar, that is exactly what I did for my last roguelike game. This concept is called inheritance. Here's the hierarchy of inheritance, with some of the shared properties and methods. This way we can maximize shared code to reduce redundancy, and it makes it so if we need to change some functionality shared amongst many different classes, the changes are automatically propagated to anything downstream. Lastly, let's consider this scenario. You want to have a special event that damages every entity in the game. However, each entity type has some sort of special behavior associated with getting damaged. Maybe some sort of tank type entity only takes half damage. A glass cannon wizard entity takes double damage. The zombie type entity actually heals when taking regular damage, 
Normally, you would have to write a verbose conditional block to check the entity type and apply the relevant damage logic. However, with object-oriented programming, you can just have each entity override a shared damage method and implement their own logic. Then you can just call the damage method on every entity and know that each entity will handle it in a way that is appropriate to them. This concept is called polymorphism because objects can exist in many forms. Let's recap. First, we have the concept of encapsulation, which reduces code complexity and increases reusability through bundling of relevant methods and properties into an object. Second, we have the concept of abstraction, which reduces the complexity of some behavior to a simple interface and allows you to much more easily refactor code. Third, we have the concept of inheritance that allows objects to inherit behavior from a parent class to eliminate redundant code. And lastly, fourth, we have the concept of polymorphism that simplifies game architecture by having the object itself determine what behavior will run. Now, let's see how to implement object-oriented programming with the Playdate SDK. Today, we're going to be making this small example of a player that can move side to side and shoot projectiles, as well as have a special ability. There are three archetypes, the knight, the giant, and the wizard that are all slightly different. If you want to follow along, I have three sprites for the different player archetypes and one for the projectile, but the source code can also be found in the description. Let's create our first class. Make sure you have the object library imported somewhere. I have it in the main file. We'll be using these other libraries as well. Create a new file, player.lua. You create a class by using class and then passing in the class name. Typically, classes are capitalized as a useful convention to differentiate them. Then you write dot extends. If you don't pass in anything, this will by default extend the basic object class. This is for if you want to create an entirely new class from scratch. However, I find myself frequently extending the sprite class, which you can do by passing in gfx.sprite, which is helpful because we can set an image, move it around, use the built-in update method, along with a lot of other things. Check out my last video on sprites to learn more. Our new player class now inherits from the sprite class. Next, let's make something called a constructor. This is what you would call whenever you wanted to create a new instance of your player. We can do that by first writing the syntax, the class name followed by a colon and then init. Init is a special method from the base object class that gets called whenever you create a new instance of a class. We can also optionally pass in some parameters when creating an object. Let's pass in x and y values as the position of the player, as well as an image that we can set on the player. Now, this player class that we made is essentially the same as a sprite, but with extra features that we provide it. That means we have access to all of the sprite's methods. Let's move the player to the position passed in, as well as set the image. This self keyword is very special. It refers to the specific instance of a class. So, for example, every time you create a new player instance, self will be referring to that particular instance and not anything else. The colon syntax is really just shorthand for taking whatever is before the colon and passing it into the first argument. Self being passed in as an argument allows the object library to know which object you're referring to. But since this is done so frequently, it makes sense to use the colon syntax and think of it as how methods are called on a particular object. Next, we create some properties. We'll set self.move speed to 1 and self.projectile speed to 1. By setting these on self, we're essentially storing these values into the object itself, which is helpful since we can retrieve these values whenever and wherever we want. It's just like creating a local variable, but the scope is contained in the object and not the file. Now, let's take in some player input. We can do that in the update method. The sprite class already has an update method, so we can do something called overriding a method. We just create another method with the same name. Make sure you're using this syntax to make it a method that belongs to the class and not just a regular function. Now, this update method will be called every frame when sprite.update is called in your main file. Let's take in some player input and move the player left and right. And here we can use the move speed property that we defined before. One thing to note is that since the sprite class already has an update method, what happens to the code in that method? Currently, this is just overwriting that code, but if you want to include it, we can write this. The super means that you're referring to the parent class you're inheriting from. In this case, you can't use the colon syntax since that will pass in super instead of the player. So we just use the normal dot syntax and pass in self. We'll be coming back to this concept later. Let's do a sanity check to see if our code is working properly. Go to your main file and create an image. I'm just going to use my knight. Then we can create a new instance of a player by calling the constructor. We do so by simply writing out the name of the class and then passing in all the relevant arguments. I'll put the player at 200, 200 and with the knight image. This new player object is now referenced in the player instance variable. 
We can then add this player instance as we would any sprite. And if you're making sure to call the sprite update function, you should see the player and be able to move. Let's make a projectile class as well. This isn't teaching anything new, so I won't go over it, but we're doing similar things with the player class. Back in the player class, let's create a method called shoot that takes in a position. This doesn't exist on the sprite class, so what we're doing here is creating an entirely new method. If we import the projectile file, we can instantiate a new projectile object using our projectile speed parameter and add it to the display list. Let's also give the player an ability method. I won't be going over timers in this video, but essentially this code just shoots out two projectiles back to back. We can now check for an A button press to call the shoot method and a B button press to call the ability method. If we run the game again, we should be able to shoot and use our special ability. Next, let's create our different player archetypes. I'll create a knight.lua file and import player. We can create the knight class that now extends the player class. For our constructor, I'll just have it take in the x and y position. Note that this constructor doesn't have the same number of parameters as the player class. This is because we already know which image we're going to use. So we can create our knight image and pass that into our parent constructor, like so. We can then set a new move speed and projectile speed. You have to be aware of the order of things that are being called. Since the parent constructor here is actually running this code, the move speed and projectile speed are set here too. So if you place this line last, your changes here will be overwritten. We can also give the knight a new ability. We can call the parent ability method and then add in two extra shots. Back in our main file, let's import the knight and replace this constructor with a knight one. Notice the much faster movement and the four shots that the ability is creating. If we look at the knight class, there's no mention of taking player input or movement, but because it extends the player class and in the update method, we're using our move speed and projectile speed properties, it propagates to those methods. I went ahead and created a giant class as well with slower move speed and projectile speed along with a new ability. Notice that I didn't call the parent method here because I've chosen not to include that functionality. If we import the giant class and replace the constructor, this is what we get. The ability is entirely different. I did the same thing for the wizard class, but added a teleport distance property and a teleportation ability. Here's what that looks like. You can also access the properties like so and manipulate them as long as you have a reference to the relevant object. I'm resetting the giant speed to be much faster and you can see how that works. One last thing I didn't mention that isn't included in this demo is how you can tell what class something is. You can get the name of the class by accessing the class name property, or you can check if an object is an instance of a class by using the isa method, which returns a boolean. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments or ask in my discord. If this was helpful, leaving a like would support this content a lot by helping it reach a greater audience. Subscribe to see more Playdate content. I post a new video every week on Monday. Thanks to my Patreon supporters for funding the creation of my videos, and see you next time.